Hello everybody, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about database. I'm Charlie Batista, I'm the Postgres Stack Lead at Percona, and today we're going to talk about disaster and how to recover from them using point-in-time recovery. Right? So let's start. Our presentation today is a uh, dive into Postgres backup using PG Backrest and how to use it for point-in-time recovery. Right. Our agenda, we're going to talk about the car, what is disaster recovery, how it relates to high availability, and what is point in time recovery, and how we can use them, and how we can use PG backrest to make the process simple and to automate the whole process. Well, and at the end, we're going to have a few, a few minutes for questions. So, what is and what about backup and disaster recovery? What are them? Uh, to start here, we need to have a basic understanding what is a disaster and how we can prevent or how we can recover from the disaster because sometimes it just happens. There is sometimes there's nothing we can do to prevent the disaster, right? For example, hard failure or even natural disaster. So things happen. Right, so the the best thing that we we need to do to be able to recover from a disaster is to be prepared, and to be prepared we need to have backups, right? So the backup is just the, the process of creating a copy of our database uh, and storing somewhere else, not storing on the same media that we have the database. That's important to understand because I've seen a lot of uh people doing backups out there and storing those copies of the, the their database backups on the same media so if you have a problem on the server then you lose the server and you lose the backup it's very important that you keep your backup safe and not on the same place as you keep your database right so the backup they allow you to rebuild the database from the time when you took the backup that's another important concept because sometimes people, they take a backup and they think they're safe of any problem. So, but what happens if you take a backup at midnight and then you have a disaster at 7 p.m.? So, you have a lot of time from midnight to 7 p.m., a lot of hours being worked there, and you may have a lot of transactions inside of your database. Then that's something that you're going to talk about later, right? And there are different types of backups. So we can have a full backup or partial backup, or incremental backup or differential backup, right? A full backup, as the name, the name implies, is a backup that you copy the whole database. You have everything and you copy everything there for, for another media, right? And incremental backups and differential backups, they're both partial backups. You don't take a full copy anymore. So they use a full when you have a huge database and the backup process takes a long time. So you don't want to, to spend a lot of time doing the backup every time that you want to do the backup. So you can do a full backup one day. Let's, let's say you do a full backup on Sundays. So you do a full backup on Sundays and then you do smaller backups. And what is the difference from incremental and differential backup? The incremental backup you always compare with the backup that you did on the day before or the previous backup if you do more uh, than one backup a day right you always compare with the previous backup let's say you took a backup on sunday a full backup on sunday and on monday when you take an incremental backup you're gonna see what is the difference on the database from today to what was yesterday when you took the full backup and this difference this increment from today to yesterday is going to be your incremental backup. On Tuesday, you're going to compare what was changed from Tuesday from the incremental backup that you did on Monday, and so on and so forth. So when you, you get to Saturday, you're going to have a full backup from Sunday, uh, an incremental that is the difference from Monday to Sunday, another difference on Tuesday that is different from Tuesday to Monday, and Wednesday and Thursday, they always have smaller backups because the difference is from the day before, it's from the previous backup, right? And the differential backup, they are similar, 
Uh, but the thing is, instead of compare with the previous backup, you have a milestone. So let's say you take a backup, a full backup on Sunday. That full backup gonna be your milestone. You always compare with that full backup from Sunday. So when you take a differential backup on Monday, we'll check what's changed from Monday to Sunday, and that's gonna be your difference for your differential backup. When you do on Tuesday, that you're gonna compare from Tuesday to Sunday. So your backup on Tuesday, they're gonna be larger than the backup on Monday. And when you do on Wednesday, on so on and so forth, when you get to Saturday, you're still gonna compare what's been changed up to Saturday to Sunday. So from you have all the changes from Sunday up to Saturday. So your backup on Saturday is gonna be the largest one of the differential backups because you compare with your milestone that's on, on Sunday, right? So on Postgres, all those process, they do a physical backup because the backups, they can be uh, categorized in logical and physical ones. You can do a logical backup on Postgres. For example, you can, you can use uh, pgdump to do a logical copy of the database. Uh, but here, for the purpose of this talk, we're always talking about physical backups. All the backups you're gonna do here are going to be physical backups, right? Okay, so, and now we know what is backup, or, and what is high availability? So, a high availability is the ability to always be working no matter what happens. So, if you have a disaster, you can, you have the ability to keep working. Let's say you have a cluster of database with three nodes. So, you have, if you lose a primary node, you still have the audit you know, you, your application can is still work, right? So you're high available in this situation. You can lose one or two or up to main X number of nodes, depending on your cluster, your application is still available, your database is still available. This is high availability. And what does it do with backups? What are the difference with backups? Do we need backups if we have a cluster, for example, if we're high available? A lot of people, they think they do not need a backup because, well, we have replicas. Uh, you have different clusters. I can always replicate my data from a cluster to another, another cluster, or to, from the primary to the replica. But then what happens if we have a bug on the application that just drops a table? So that drop table will be replicated, right? So, and we are still available. We are highly available. But the problem is now we are highly available missing one table. It's not, it's not good. It's not a good scenario to happen, right? So high availability in the sense of having any extra nodes, they do not uh, help on those cases. We still need a backup, right? And the thing is, those are part of what we call a disaster recovery plan. So we need to have a disaster recovery plan to be able to recover from those problems. Not being highly available doesn't solve all the problems. It doesn't mean that we cannot have a certain type of disaster that will be propagated for the other nodes, right? And that's are the things. When you have a disaster recovery plan, you need to account for those situations. We need to be prepared to be highly highly available if the cluster we, we we know we lose one of the nodes in the cluster if we lose the whole cluster so these needs to be in our disaster recovery plan we also need to be prepared if a problem happens if a disaster on the data happens if an inconsistency on the database happens or if we lose a table or the whole database in in a drop table or drop or drop database situations right we need to be prepared and those, they come into consideration of the disaster recovery plan, right? And this is when the backup that takes place. So even if you have a highly available cluster and with multiple nodes and many different, in different regions and different countries and different data centers. So if 
something happens that you have an inconsistency of your data and you need to recover that, that data from that it was there before, this is when you, you need a backup. That's when the backup comes to place. So because that inconsistency may be propagated to all the nodes that you have in your cluster, right? And this on the high uh, on the disaster recovery plan is what we call the recovery point objective, right? So if I have this type of problem, if I lose data, what is the max amount of time that I need to spend to recover that data back? And what is the minimal time that I can recover that data back? For example, let's say I cannot, I, I can afford to lose one hour of the data. So if I have a problem, if I have a, a, a drop table, and if that drop table happened in between an, uh, one hour before, I can re recover that data. So this is an RPO of one hour, right? So, and to achieve this RPO, I can, for example, take backups every one hour. For example, I can take incremental backups every one hour. Uh, but what happens if I cannot lose that much? What happens if I can lose, like, for example, one minute later? I need to take backups every one minute. It's not affordable, it's not doable. What happens if I cannot lose any second of data or if I need to keep the max data that's possible? I, I cannot afford to take uh, one second backup, backup every one second, right? That would be very, quite expensive. And for those situations is when it comes handy, what we call point in time recovery. So the point in time recovery is the ability to go back in time and recover to the, the database up to that moment when the database was stable, the data was consistent, and you just specify that moment, right? And as I was saying, like if we have one hour RPO, if we have one minute RPO, we cannot afford, sometimes we cannot afford to take backups every one hour, every one minute. We need to have something that is more efficient. We need to have something that help us to be more effective when uh, keeping the data. And in Postgres, also in other database, but we're talking about Postgres, in Postgres, we do have uh, a mechanism that keeps saving all the transactions, everything that happens on the database to a log file. And this is this log file is what we call the wall log files. It is, this is the right ahead log. So everything that we do on the database, every transaction that we do on Postgres, every time that we write, when we do insert and delete and delete a drop table or create table, whatever we do inside of the database that writes to the database, it's being sent to the right ahead log. So what if we can have a backup? Let's say we have the backup, as I said yesterday at midnight, and they keep all those wall files. And if something happens today at 7 p.m., let's say I drop a table at 7 p.m., and then I restore the backup and have a way to force the database to process again all those wall files up to the moment before I have that drop table. So I can recover everything and I can somehow skip that drop table, right? That's ingenious. And this is exactly what the point in time recovery does. So we recover a base backup, a backup from a moment in time that we, we know that the data we need is, is still there. We identify when the, the problem happened, when the inconsistency, when the drop table, whatever problem happened to our database. And then you tell the database, you tell Postgres, look, I want you to recover from the wall files. I want you to read the wall files and process all the transactions until this point in time. When you get to this point here, I want you to stop because, well, I want to, to, to get that my data back. And this is exactly what is a point in time recovery. And this is, is what we're going to do today, right? So the point in time recovery allows us to 
recover the data up to a certain point in time when the data that we need is still there, right? So, and in Postgres, we do use a base backup. We use a physical base backup to recover the database and then the wall files to force the database to read all of those files, right? Okay, but like, how does it work? Well, this is the time when things start getting interesting, right? Now we gonna play and try to understand and simulate how those things work. Okay, here I have my database. And this database, I have one table that at this moment has 10,000 roles. Let me show you here. We have 10,000 roles. See, so we have this table T1, and this table has 10,000 roles. Uh, I'm archiving this to those those files, uh, the wall files. Remember I said I'm archiving here. Here you have the archive command. And the archive command is using this uh, shell script. Yeah. Let's see what this shell script does. The shell script is archiving everything inside of this folder. Data PGSQL archive 14. So if we check this folder, we'll see that we have two all files here. Oh, right. So before I do anything, what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna do a backup. I'm gonna use my PG base backup, and I'm gonna do a backup here. So this is a very simple command. You can find all the parameters on the configuration files. So I'm not going through all of them here. Uh, but the most important here is the is the data gear. So this is where I'm sending my backup, right? So you connect to the database. I'm sending the backup here. It can do a backup uh, with uh, a database that is remote. You can do a remote backup for a database. If you do so, you need to, to specify the connection, string, a user, and thing. And here, because I'm not using any user and I'm doing the local host, I'm not specifying anything. Uh, I don't want to, to compress the backup. I could have the, the option here to compress the backup. You use a tar file. I don't want, because if we do that, I need to uncompress and we don't want to waste this time here because that's not the, the purpose and i want the backup to start as fast as possible so pg base backup will wait for postgres to do a checkpoint and it will not start the backup until it, it has a checkpoint and with this option here it will try to force postgres to do a checkpoint right be careful with this option if you if you have a lot of transactions in your database you might make your, your database to do a lot of I.O. here because it would try to force to do a checkpoint. Those for now are the important ones. The dash V is verbose. And OK, I, that's going to run here. And at this point, we should have a backup in this folder. Yeah, we do have a backup in this folder here. Right. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to insert a uh, few thousand roles on my database here my my table has 13 roles now it has 15 and just simulating some sort of application working here and sort incrementally and if you see here we have a timestamp right and we'll see that this timestamp is going to be important for the purpose of our access uh, our exercise here so 19,000 and here we get to 21,000 roles so we have 21,000 roles in this table at this timestamp here, right? And I'm playing along my database and doing something, and I just run a drop table. My goodness, I just run a drop table here. I just realized it now that it was not supposed to run this drop table here, right? And what now? What can I do now? That's pretty bad. It's pretty catastrophic, right? So first thing, I need to do, okay, let me check if my table is still there. I, I, want, I want to check if my table is still there. Well, it's not there. It's not here. The table doesn't exist. We see in the error, uh, error log. By the way, this is the, uh, the log file of Postgres. The table is not there. So I'm going to stop my database. So first things first, I'm going to stop my database. And I'm going to copy this data here because I, I'm going to recover a backup and I'm going to do a point in time recover. I still want to have a copy of this database, even 
it's it's compromised right because if something goes badly i still have a copy of this database that was working it was compromised i'm missing data but i still have a copy of this database so i'm gonna move uh it's 14 to i'm gonna call it here pitr 14 right so that's what i'm gonna call i'm gonna my database also what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a copy of my archives because I can do a mistake and I can compromise my archive, right? That would be also be bad. So I'm gonna do a CP and my archive is on data, data pgsql archive 14. So I'm gonna do this here and I'm gonna do the same. I'm gonna call it P itr archive so this is p dash r so i'm gonna have a now i have a copy of my archive files right so if i do something bad if i mess up with with the recovery process here i still have my point in time recovery and i'm gonna mess up here because well i want to show you that we we have the we still have the the backup files right so my backup files is let me do a cp-r here. It is on backup 14. So, and I'm gonna copy it here. So now I have my database. I need to change the LCH mode 700 this folder, or else it won't start. And here we have uh, one file that database is gonna complain. We'll see. So yeah, this postmaster file. So it doesn't have here, but it we have it on our backup folder, right? So our backup folder is cppitr. This file we want to just copy on into 14. Now we can restart our database. I'm gonna stop here this log because this is a load file, and actually I'm going to restart my database. Yeah restart the database so the database restarted here if i go here and do a select what do i have what am i have here i have the original 10,000, right so at least i know my backup works uh, but at this point i might have messed up with my archive files because well i didn't change their archive configuration and here my database is archiving and see it's tried to archive files and some of those files are they're there and some of those files they just been rewritten from from the process here if i didn't do the backup of the archive files before starting here we would have a problem we would not be able to do a point in time record so let me stop here i'm gonna stop this process here Right, I'm gonna shoot down. Uh, I'm gonna remove uh, the 14. I'm gonna also remove the backup archive, backup, not backup, the archive 14. This is the one we're using. So, and I'm gonna CP the archive 14 actually it's pitr14 to archive14 right and this is a dash r so we have our archive back and i'm gonna also copy our data gear back our backup back right so cp it should be backup14 here and the postmaster and C H mode. Okay. So we have almost everything. Now we need two things. The first thing we need to tell the database uh, up to when we want to recover. And to do so, we put on the on the file name postgresql.auto.com. I already have this here. I actually is 14. To 14 i'm gonna copy inside of my my database and i also need to signal 
to tell the database I want to recover. And to be to do so, I need to create a file that's named recovery.signal inside of the data there, right? So, but this file here, it doesn't reflect uh, all the information that I have. Remember those timestamps that I said they would be important for us. We're going to use them here because I need to tell the database what is our recovery target. So we can tell the recovery target as a timestamp. We can tell us LSN and we can tell what is the, the transaction ID up to we want to recover. I have the timestamp. So I'm going to work with the timestamp. And here, I know that at this timestamp, my database was consistent. This table, that's one that I want to recover, was consistent at this timestamp here. And I know that at this timestamp was when the drop happened. So if I recover my database from whatever time between this timestamp time and this timestamp, I'll be good, right? So I'll just copy this timestamp here. Or I just copy this one here, it doesn't matter. Uh, I will copy this timestamp. Are you gonna tell what is the timestamp here? Oops, I didn't copy properly. So let me copy the timestamp, let me paste the timestamp. And the difference here, I have few seconds. This is a uh, timestamp was 55 and two seconds, and this is a 55, 14 seconds. So what I'm gonna do, so I know that whatever in between, I'll be safe. So then I'm gonna do, just to be safe, 10 seconds here. So I will ask the database, recover up to this point. I don't want to include this point, right? Because I know that it, at this point, it was the data, it, it was there. I don't have to be this point. So this target, I don't want to be inclusive. It might be there's some situation that you want to include the, even the, the, the target time. But here, I don't want to. And after the database finishes, I want the database to promote, restart the database. Because I want to copy that data and recover and do whatever I want to, to do with that data, right? So I want the database or else we can use a target arc, uh, action to pause. So if the database pauses, uh, we cannot connect, cannot do anything. Or we will just want to shoot now. So we want to recover that data and copy it to somewhere else. So it depends what you want to do. I, at this point, I want the database to start and I want to connect the database and make sure my data is there. So I want here to tell my log file, right? So this is my log file. And what I need to do here, I need to restart my database. And let's hope it will work. And here is what we get. See, it's restored from the, 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 the backup files. And it's saying that it's just reading for, from our wall files. See, it's restored from these wall files 03, from wall file 04, and was wall file ending with 05. So it restarted. So theoretically now we are good and the database is online and it's accepting connections. So if I do a select now, I get my 20,000 rows back. So I was able to get my rows back with this process. But see, this is a complicated process, right? This process is not as easy. And there are a lot of things get can can go bad so in this process and to make things better so what we can do is we can use an automation tool a tool like pg backrest right so how does it help us so first of all what is pg backrest pg backrest is it's a postgres backup tool so it's instead it's intended to be scalable reliable easy to use and to be extendable so and it has a lot of nice features like it can do backups in parallel it can do local and remote backups so it can do full backups it can do incremental backups it can do differential backups and it can also do rotation of backups and rotation of archive. It can do expiration. So it has a lot of nice features. It can help 
to control a lot of nice things. So it's really nice to have PG backrest. So we are not here to talk, to explain how that works, to explain how that, that uh, we installed PG backrest. We're here to see how we can use PG backrest to do a point in time recovery, right? So I do have a PG backrest here. So it's running. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go back to our terminal right so this is our terminal and i'm gonna stop my database and i'm gonna rebuild this database and instead of use that manual process i'm gonna uh use pg backrest i have a nice script here app beam test init cluster so this script here we just drop the database rebuild the database and we're gonna have our database with everything is empty right so we don't have the backup we don't have anything anymore here uh, for example if i check my backup 14 we see it's empty so it's an empty folder and this database it comes back to our 10,000 rolls so it's just Recovery, restore to the original point where we started uh, with our other example. So, but what I want to do here is before we start, remember we have 10,000 rows, we're going to do the same. But before uh, I start here, I'm going to do a full backup, but now using PG Backrash. So, it's just this simple command here. If everything works fine, it will do the full-time backup, it will check the archives, it will do everything. It will check, and you'll see it's ended successfully. Now I have a full-time backup. I didn't do anything, I still have my 10,000 rolls. So, but now I have my, my full, full backup, right? So, and I'm gonna do again all those inserts. So, I'm gonna do them faster here so because or else you're gonna start running out of time right so I have 19,000 rows on my database right so if I do a select here let's see how many rows we have at this point we have 19,000 rows so and we know that at this point here we're very good we're safe and Again, I'm just working and then I drew a drop table file. My goodness. Again, I'm sorry, I let me put the log files here. So as you see, the log files here are we didn't do much. And if I try to do a select, we're gonna see that the table doesn't exist. I drop at the table, right? So that's pretty bad. Not nice, not good, and now I don't even have my base backup anymore, right? So what we do, again, we stop the database, right? Uh, I'm going to make a copy of this folder. Actually, I'm going to move this folder. I'm going to do a copy of this folder because for PG backrest, I want to keep this folder. So I'm going to do a copy of this folder and I'm going to call back backrest 14 right so okay uh, yeah i want to okay i want to copy the folder 14 to backrest 14 now nice. now we have a copy of this folder here if we mess up with things we still have this folder right so what we want to do now now we want to recover the database and we want to use the PG backrest. So I'm going to tell the PG backrest to do check. I have this stanza that one that we're using, the PITR. So, and I want it to use the Delta and I have a target, right? So, and my target here, let me just copy in here. My target here is Remember the time that the database was saved. So if I check here, at this point, my database was saved. I still have my 19,000 rows, 
right? So this is my target. I want to recover to this point in time, right? So, and the action that I want to do after recover is to promote. Remember the action that we had on the recover.conf? Yeah, we're just telling the PG backrest the same thing. And I want it to restore. It's not a backup. It's the type of this, this action here. It's a restore type, right? So I run it here. I hope everything goes well. See, we have some change in our uh, log files. We see things are moving. And what interesting enough is we can check on 14 that PG backrest probably did the change for us the postgresql.alto.conf look the pg backrest just did it for us and it created the restore command and the restore command is using the pg backrest configuration that we have is they using the stanza that they, that they uh, have here and if i go here and start my database oh i don't have this Postmaster, okay. That's easy. So if I do my restart here, so our database is ready and see it's restored as well. And if we check here, if you do a select, now we have back our 19,000 rolls. And if you see here, it was a lot easier doing the process with PG backrest. It was a lot, uh, we had the, the probability of error a lot less than if we, if we are using the manually process. And that's the main idea. So it's to use an automation to like PG backrest to do things a lot faster and a lot easier and to make those things uh, less error prone so we are avoiding problems and we are a still able to get back in time for when we the, the problem happened when i made a mistake and i dropped those tables this is the point in time recover and this is how we use a tool like pg backrest to make our operation a lot simpler and smoother right so, and yeah, that's, that's what we have for today. I thank you a lot for, for our presentation. So here at Percana, we really love open source, really, really love open source, and we are hiring. We have a lot of open positions. We have open positions for Postgres. We have open positions for MySQL, for MongoDB. And if you love open source like we do, if you want to join an amazing team, then just give me give me a mail send me a message or just find us here on percona.com slash careers so you see uh our uh all the open positions that we have there and any questions so if, if you have any questions uh i'll be glad to to answer here and also you can follow me on my linkedin so you you can see my linkedin here and drop me a question on my email so either way you can drop me a question on linkedin or my email so it would be uh, glad to to answer any questions and thank you again and have a great day Yep.
Yeah, definitely. Let let let's let's start here, right? Oh, shall look we? At that, look at that. He just jumped right into it. He just yeah. So, yeah. so I was going to say this. So we have three workloads today that we're going to look at. So Charlie created a, a system that's that has a, a, a decidedly Charlie-esque workload, which means that it's a box that's falling over um, and gonna gonna fall over dead because it's old and decrepit. Um, and aged, aged, as Charlie said. Yeah, that's and, yeah, and, that, and, that's a bad thing. And I've got two separate workloads uh, that that I'm going to throw at Charlie as well. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Before I go with your workload that I have no idea, I haven't seen. Um, that's that's a good thing. So because well, it's usually how we do it for client, right? So we have customers. They they have a problem in their workload. Open a ticket. And then sometimes you need just to jump in to help them without no background. So that's your workload. Well, my workload, even though I have some background here, uh, I'm doing not much in on my workload. The only thing I'm doing here is a load test. I'm using PG Bench. Really, really, really simple stuff. I'm gonna show you the, the command in, in the field, uh, but there's nothing special here. So as we can see from this result, I'm getting around 17, 1800, sometimes 2000 transactions per second, right? So nothing impressive. Uh, and the customer, the user wants to know why our database is behaving so slowly. This is not a super hardware, I should say, but if we take a look, let's take a look on the specs of my hardware here. We have eight CPUs. We have 32 gigabytes RAM memory, and we have 512 gigabytes disk. So it's a decent box, let's say, that could do a lot better than 1500 transactions per second, right? So, and then my customer my, is, it's asking why it's so slow, it's behaving so slow. So we need to go here and start investigating what problems we might have. So we have many, many different approaches. The one that I, we, we're gonna use here is not the only one that we can use. And sometimes you can also find a, a different approach that works better for you. So. This is fine, right? Uh, but one thing that we need to, to keep in mind is whatever approach we use, we need to be methodic, right? We need to use a method and go through that method. So, and this is what we're trying to go here. So then when I do start to investigate, usually there are three things, uh, sometimes four, that I go first. So first things, it's CPU usage. So I usually take a look on my CPU, on the CPU to see how it's being used. Well, the CPU is under 75% utilization here. There are some extra information I'm not going to do at now, but like just CPU, while it's not a badge, uh, it says 75% utilization here, right? So if I go for my disk utilization, well, let's, let's see memory because we're right here. So memory is not bad. So we see, we hear used memory, like really used memory is like just this small portion in yellow here. We still have a lot of free memory that we, we, we can use. If we take a look on the swap, we almost didn't use any swap. We see some swap activity here and there, which is usually not good. We don't want to see those activities, but like, it doesn't seem to be the problem, especially because, well, the server is behaving badly for a long time. It's not only those, those, those period of times here. IO, well, it's, it's not that bad. It's, it's getting some IO, but it's a database, right? It should read and write. So it's writing, like, uh, reading more than writing on my database here. So, and the disk load here, it's uh, we have some late load here, but like the right load, it shouldn't be that bad. So what do you 
would you say, Matt, from, from what we, we see here, what is, do you have a hint for what is the problem, what, where we, we should go just for those basic information here? Well, what so would you say? A lot of memory. You're probably have things yeah. that are, yeah. And, and, and you were seeing some yeah. disk IO there? Yeah, yeah, we do have some disk yeah. IOC here. So we're probably looking at some of the memory settings, um, you know, and so that's where, you know, you're, you're probably not, don't have enough uh, being put into memory reading too much from disk. Okay, so if we go for memory settings on Postgres, we're talking about which do you, do you have on top of your mind, which configuration we, we go for memory setting? If you don't have, it's fine. Like even I sometimes don't have. Yeah, like you're, you're, you're talking like shared buffers. You're talking um, a oh. couple others. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's let's take a look on the shared buffers. By the way, so Charlie's I, I just changed it. Asks me questions and tries to quiz me during live streams, just so everyone's aware. <laughs> like like everyone else is just like you know, let me show you what to do, and I'm off. You know, like getting people uh, on the, and answering questions behind the scenes, and then Charlie starts throwing me like questions, and I'm like, "What? I need to pay attention." Um, yeah, yeah, please. You know, you, oh, we need to oh, to yeah, keep yeah. it interactive. You know, otherwise people are gonna sleep out there. We don't want people sleeping, right? So at least someone should be under pressure. This oh, is oh, how we. So I, know? Okay, so yeah. now I'm gonna go invite other people so they can be under pressure, not me. Well, you, well, you are, you are free to ask for help. Why not? Right? <laughs> So who who wants to come help me out um, live stream wise while <laughs> while I'm while I'm here trying to do this? But anyways, go on, Charlie. Let's uh, let's yeah, continue no. on. You, yeah, yeah, you, you said shared buffers, right? So let's let's take a look on on the shared buffers. We have here eight gigabytes for shared buffer, which is not bad, right? Like recommendations for Postgres is not used too much. I have 32 gigabytes of RAM for the OS. So if we have eight gigabytes shared buffers, let's say the OS uses two gigabytes. So we are left with 15, 14 gigabytes for the kernel cache, right? The OS cache that's supposedly to help us with IO, right? Yep. Uh, so I would say this, this, this value is not bad. Like, for, for for this box should should be fine. Uh, what else could you could you take a look? Oh. Well, if you want to to look at anything here, so I, I just changed it from one dashboard. This dashboard is on the, the OS perspective, and this oh, is okay. the Postgres yeah. dashboard. Right? Yeah. So just to, to make sure we're on the same page. So this is the Postgres dashboard. Okay. So one of the other let's, things let's is you've a got a lot of connections, right? So each of the we connections do. is going to consume uh, quite a bit of memory. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. We got a lot of connections. Uh, we didn't take a look of how many connections you have, right? So, and yeah, as you mentioned here, we are over, I would say 500 connections, right? That's, that's, that's quite a lot for this box. That is. Uh, right, so, it, and it may say something. So we already identified one problem. We have too many connections for this box, right? Absolutely. So there should be some so, connection pooling or something there to uh, uh, limit those. Indeed, indeed. And we're going to try with the connection pooling later. Um, before we do any change, we're going to just switch from direct connections to the connection pool to see if we get any improvement, right? Just like without changing any configuration, I'm just going to stop my load and point to a connection pool because I have here a connection. I have a PG bouncer there, but just minimum configuration, listening on the port 6532. So we're gonna jump and see if it changes anything. But before we do that, let's let's keep the investigation. Okay, yeah, we do have two main connections for this instance. Uh, we have like over 500 connections here. Uh, and if we take a look here on the activity itself, it doesn't look to have too many things doing because something is, is really putting my, my server uh, on its knees, right? And let's go back to so, the OS. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah it, please. It, it looks like you're doing quite a bit of checkpointing as well. So I'm cheating and looking at graphs in the background. 
Um, you, you, you've got some. You've got some pretty big spikes that are happening mm -hmm. on a on a regular, I do, yeah. regular basis. Look, look at that big checkpoint stats, but uh, it does. Yeah, yeah, it does. And some from time to time, also we just flush a lot of buffers, like it's expected because of checkpoints, right? So no, no, you you can ask whatever information for for us to take a look here. It's fine. We, we, we are investigating, right? So, and sometimes I myself just miss some one point or another. So uh, other cup of ice, they, they definitely can account. Okay, we have two things, too many connections and we have a lot of checkpoints. Checkpoints are bad. Well, they're not bad per se, but like when we're there too often, they're bad because they bring problem with IOs, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah, yep. okay. One thing that I want to show you here, remember that I, I said that are some hidden information on the CPU dashboard, CPU graph here, is see this red stuff? Yeah, IO wage. The red one, yeah, this is the IO wage. And this is pretty bad. So what is the IO wage thing on this graph? What is it is, it is telling me here? Can you explain to us in like in one short sentence? It's basically you are waiting for I/O to complete before you can use the CPU. That's perfect. So the I/O wait well, is I, the the way in which you said that time. almost was like it wasn't perfect, but you couldn't think of a good way to tell me it wasn't, and then you were kind of disappointed <laughs> that I actually got it right. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that Charlie was trying to you know thought like I'll throw on the CPU. I, I know you knew about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't have asked you, Matt, if I didn't have confidence on you. Oh, you know? oh okay. and that's why I'm asking yeah, yeah, because yeah. I, I do have confidence. <laughs> you know, uh, and and that's the thing. So we are the CPU is wasting a lot of time waiting for I/O. CPU is that that's the main reason why our CPU is under utilization here. I would say, if we take a look, this green stuff here is the time that the user space postgres yeah very, very, limited, this very way, limited is using cpu so it's almost nothing mm -hmm. right even the kernel the systems system time here is doing almost nothing so and this huge amount of disk utilize not utilization but waiting time is killing our server right this is this is the major problem that we have here we have a huge IO bound system in this case. Yes. Right? And this is killing our database performance. Well, we need to find a way to deal with those things. There are parameters on Postgres that can help us. And also there are actions that we can do from the kernel, the OS perspective. Well, at some point we cannot scale and we need to either split the load between two different servers or get better uh, hardware for, for disk, it, it might, we might get to that point, but we don't know yet. So for what we, we, the only thing that we know at this moment is that we are putting too much pressure on our IO subsystem, right? Okay, before we change anything, remember that I told you I would change to use, uh, just show you, this is the command I'm using here, right? I'm gonna change just the port here, instead use the connection directly to the database, I'm gonna use PG Bouncer. So my PG Bouncer has the configuration to only send a max of 100 connections to the database. So you've right? already set up PG Bouncer. It's yeah, I already have one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's there. So I can show you like in a set, in a field. And well, if we take a look, looks like we, we got some improvement. Doesn't seem to be like, well, it depends. It, it's, it's, it's significant. Consistent. It, it's more consistent. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Exactly. So, um, but you could see well, yeah. that in PMM with, uh, you know, the different graphs, right? Mm hmm. Okay, it's updating here. Uh, but even then, 
we still are putting a lot of pressure, right? We still, we still see here, like from OS perspective, let's take a look on the, the connection. So the connection should drop. Yeah, it dropped here. See, this is when we stop the, the, the load. And here is when the, we, we got the load back with PG Bouncer. So we have less than half of the numbers connection, right? So the max number of connections. Sometimes we're going to have more here because the connection dies and it stays uh, open for some, uh, some period of time, waiting for, for, for the kernel to, to release them. So that's expected to see more than the max number of connections we put here. So that's fine. But and the point that, you know, when you, when you start to look like, for instance, even like your, your tuple activity there, you could see a pretty significant increase uh, yeah, already. Yeah, it does. Because you're not fighting for resources, right? 